Excellent. What's up guys, welcome to Pulse Hardware. It is a brand new launch of a new series of both CPUs as well as motherboards uh, from Intel. Well, the CPUs are from Intel, the motherboards from our <laughs> in Intel's partners, such as Asus. And as I've been doing uh, kind of a tradition now, I've been bringing JJ over to take a look at as many of their new motherboards as we can. So that's what we're doing today. We have a wide range of Asus Z270 motherboards here. They all support the new KB Lake processors that uh, should be out now or out very soon from Intel. Uh, and they've all got Z270 chip chipsets. And there's actually four different product lines. So let's start out with that, JJ. Uh, what are the four different pro product lines and which segments of the market are they sort of aimed at? Uh, so first up, we're going to have the traditional series that kind of we've been, I think, most known for. So this is historically covered boards like the Deluxe, the Pro, or the Dash A, uh, which has been really popular. And these are all now designated underneath what we call our Prime series of motherboards. Right. Easiest way that you'll probably be able to see them is that they're going to be the boards that are essentially white. So if you see essentially yeah. a board that's got that uh, kind of... Um, black PCB and then that white design aesthetic, that's going to be that series. And in terms of generally who we're trying to target, um, I would say that the Prime series is really kind of the foundation from ASUS. You're getting, you know, best in class design, so you're going to get improvements in pretty much every key category that you would want, whether it's audio, networking, fan control, ZUFI, uh, all that really great stuff, build quality is going to be elevated. Um, but it's really kind of designed for really anybody, whether you're a gamer, whether you're looking to be able to build a hybrid system. So uh, content creation, advanced productivity, uh, maybe a little bit mixing of all of those things, it's going to make a really great foundation for all of them. Cool. Uh, next up, we have the Tough series. I've mm -hmm. been a long time fan of the Tough series. Are there any changes to this, or is this kind of main, maintaining where it's been? Pretty much, it's going to be uh, pretty close to it. Um, probably the biggest change is that people, when they're looking for the board, they might be uh, thinking that they're going to put like Sabertooth. Historically, the boards have always uh, that we've generally messaged because uh, we did have some variants in the past, such as like the Griffin. Mm -hmm. um, there's no more Sabertooth, so everything falls under the Tough. So it's going to be the Tough. 270 and there's going to be a mark one and then there's going to be a mark two okay. and that's just going to be like previous generations and we'll go into some of those differences in general but we got both of them here in terms of uh, kind of your target demographic really first and foremost i would say this is really for advanced productivity uh for content creation enthusiasts uh for prosumers and professionals that are looking for validation with specialized equipment especially stuff like quadro cards tesla xeon mm -hmm. phi things along those lines um, and definitely I'd say any type of cooling and water cooling enthusiasts. Anybody that's really interested in fans and a lot of control and monitoring, uh, these cards are purpose built for them. We've also updated a little bit of some of the overclocking functionality. So definitely still enthusiast gamers can find this as a foundation as well. Beautiful, and more on that when we cover the boards. Strix, of course, uh, was sort of introduced as a sub-brand of ROG. Is that, is that a fair assessment of that? Uh, somewhat, somewhat. Yeah. So, so in the previous generation, we had uh, what we called our pro gaming line. So that existed mm -hmm. for a little period of time. But now, essentially, uh, we've uh, folded everything underneath the Strix banner. Um, so Strix, along with ROG, pretty much make up the dedicated uh, gamer segment series of motherboards that we produce. Now, like we said, the Prime and the Tough can definitely be gaming-oriented boards, but when you talk about Strix or ROG, they're purpose-built. So everything from the features, the functionality, and the software stack that all goes in there is going to be designed for gamers first and foremost. Um, so with Strix, you're going to predominantly be at a little bit more focused at, say, entry and high-performance mid-range series of motherboards in terms of their price band okay um, and it's going to be kind of like a trickle down effect where a lot of the cutting edge features and functions that we saw on the highest end ROG boards start to kind of get in incorporated into those Strix series. So if you're building a system for gaming first, Strix is probably where you're going to want to go. Although that's not, again not to say that any of these other boards can't do gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course the ROG series, the cream of the crop, uh, basically whatever you guys can think of that you want to throw into high-end boards, that's where the ROG goes. But uh, you've expanded the line too. There's 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 both the more expensive feature-rich ones, but also the uh, sort of more affordable ones as well now. Correct. So for ROG, you know, uh, we now have a very expensive product line, and when you tie in Strix, there's a lot of boards that you're going to be able to pick on. Um, but from uh, specifically the launch boards, you're going to have the Hero, you're going to have the Code, and you're going to have the Formula. The code is new. Yes, Code is brand new. Um, okay. And so these are going to definitely sit at the higher end of the spectrum. So for users that I think really want to focus first and foremost on aesthetics, extremely specialized features and functions, advanced audio design, uh, really robust overclocking, and really looking for attention to detail. I think I'm at all aspects of the board for an enthusiast oriented build, of course, you're going to want to gravitate towards ROG. Okay, and we have uh, the Hero and the Formula today, so uh, I'm going to put links down in the description uh, to shortcuts if you want to jump straight to the overviews of any of these boards. We're going to be doing a little bit more detail on each one. But before we do that, 
what would you say are kind of the non-negotiables that you have that sort of cover all the boards from sort of a certain point up? Mm -hmm. uh, the features that you were like, every board has to have this, and so every board does. Yeah, so um, historically, the way we've always tried to frame this is usually kind of from our perspective, what we call non-negotiables of design, right? And so these are really kind of the foundation of making sure that if you go about building a system, uh, you're going to get this kind of guaranteed level of experience. So I think the first one is aesthetics. Aesthetics has increasingly become really important when you go about building a system. Uh, even when we talk about quote-unquote budget builds, like if you're building mm -hmm. like a $750 system, doesn't mean that it has to look bad. It it's, can look it's still got to match. The yeah. colors can match. You still want it to look good. You still want to be able to have, I think, a consistent ID and a specialized look and feel. So I think regardless of any of these boards you look at, you're going to see that they've got a really strong uh, and specialized design aesthetic. And we've tried to also make sure that they complement, I, I think, the, the targeted kind of themes that we see in terms of color builds uh, that are popular in the community. So, of course, with the Prime, you get that white. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different types of white chassis uh, that are on the market. And, of course, white components like our dual series of graphics cards and a number of other types of per and products that are out there. And I also like white purposely uh, for a contrast perspective too. So mm -hmm. I like sometimes throwing it in black or silver builds oh, yeah. just to be able to add contrast. It doesn't always have to be white on white. Um, so I think that's interesting. So that's I also like uh, just that there's no real strong like color theme with any of these. I mean, maybe a little bit more uh, some of the military theme with the, with the tough boards, but even that's very subtle. So if you wanted to have like, oh, I want a purple build or a yellow yep. build or something like that, any of these should pretty much match up with that, um, of course, with the right touches. But that's uh, that's kind of the beauty of making your own system, making, yeah. it, making it work for you. And you make a perfect point there, and that's probably the ending point, I think, on the aesthetics, is, is that we consciously made an effort, especially with the gaming series of boards, where we know that there's going to be probably more of a focus when it comes to RGB lighting and having a lot of uh, secondary colors, whether it's on the components or accessories, whether it's the chassis or cables or mm -hmm. fans or whatever it might be to make sure that those boards are essentially monochromatic, right? Okay. So that you're looking at kind of um, silver, gray, and black tones, so that that's always gonna complement any color color scheme that you wanna go with. Okay, so any other non-negotiables that uh, across the board? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah for All sure. Right. So <laughs> that's actually the next one is I would say that a big focus for this generation is gonna be RGB lighting. Okay. So um, right now, just a little bit before the launch of this z 270 chipset, we had just finalized what we called our Air, uh, Aura Sync initiative. So this was essentially the ability to have um, all ASUS components be synchronized in terms of how you can control the RGB lighting experience. Mm -hmm. So that went from the motherboard to the graphics card, uh, to LED strips, to compatible chassis, uh, to our Claymore keyboard, to our Spotham mouse, uh, and now even DRAM modules. So across the board, it's really the first time that you can have a consistent lighting experience that can be uniquely controlled. And so for this generation, of course, all the boards have been phased in to be able to offer this type of synchronization, uh, which I think is fantastic. And we've upped the ante by um, pretty much the majority of them you're gonna see are gonna have two RGB headers that are built on. Nice. And we've also strategically placed them. So generally when you find that there's gonna be the two headers one is going to be placed at the top of the board and then another one at the bottom of the board. So that works out really well when you have to kind of run the LED strip maybe on the top end. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to have it kind of hidden in uh, the internal cavity for the top of the chassis. Or maybe you're running out to an LED strip that's built into the chassis uh, or something along those lines. So I think that's really awesome. And a question that you had asked as well is that we have also incorporated even more granularity and control. So you're going to be able to have the ability to customize things like sequencing where you want mm -hmm. the, uh, the LED chain to start off. Uh, and then you can also go ahead and have independent control for each one of the connected devices under the Aura software. So whether you're talking about other devices that are connected, uh, individual zones on the board itself, as well as the individual RGB uh, leads that come off of there. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful for everyone, except for the few people who are just totally sick of the RGB trend. But you know what, you can just turn the lights off too. I mean, that's always, that's always yeah. an option. Yeah, and, um, and, <laughs> and you don't know, and I think, you know, one touch little point there too is that you don't always have to focus on making it flashy. Like mm -hmm. a lot of times what I tend to do is I end up having just a synchronized kind of more of ambient light. Yeah. And I think that when you execute it like that, even when you have all the devices, it can look really clean and just, it adds a little bit of pop to the system, but it's not necessarily like you're trying to have everything just uh, be lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah, so tons of flexibility there. Uh, sorry for the train rolling by, but we're gonna press on. Uh, other non-negotiables? So next one 
about, I think, would be the audio design. So we've really been kind of an industry leader at trying to incorporate specialized audio design. And we've pretty much seen now that every competitor out in the marketplace has adopted what we originally uh, innovated and implemented on our industry's motherboards, which was the isolated audio design, right? Uh, and that's pretty much par for the course. All these boards, of course, all have an isolated audio design. They have an operational amplifier built on board. They have a D-pop filter. Um, they've got a lot of really great stuff. But what's really special is that we code work with Realtek. So this is the first time in quite a number of years that we have a new Realtek codec that's being implemented. So okay. this is the S1220. Ah. Um, and this is a really special audio codec. And you're going to pretty much find this on every board with the exception of the Mark II okay. that we have here. So all of these now feature this very, very high-end audio codec. And one of the really special special aspects about uh, is, is that it has significantly improved dynamic range, which is really important in terms of it capturing you know, your, your lows and then your maximum highs, and then also the signal noise ratio on both input and output has been significantly improved. Oh. And the reason why that's really important is that if you're doing anything like streaming, uh, you're doing any uh, uh, recording, um, and you're using both your line in and your line out, uh, if you don't want to necessarily make the investment in like a prosumer like DAC or something like that to be able to really be able to get a high quality level, you can now feel really comfortable that the line level input quality is very good on the board. Nice. And uh, of course, for some of our higher end boards, uh, like the ROG series, they take it even to the next level where we've evolved the work that we laid the foundation with on uh, working with uh, Sabre, and we've incorporated even a more advanced ESS 9023 Sabre DAC on there. So okay. uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of that cool stuff, but I think audio uh, for this generation is really awesome. So music, movies, games, videos, whatever you're going to be doing, you can get a really great audio experience. Wonderful. All right. Uh, uh, any other any any fan controls fan always. controls of course you know you know me I'm a stickler for when it comes to fan controls I think they're always super interesting and super important I think mm -hmm. about making sure that your system is not only efficiently cooled but it's also quiet right I mean I hate having a system that's loud and I want to be able to really manage how everything works so all of these boards they feature our fan expert technology so that means that uh, brass tacks, when you get either into the UEFI or into the operating system, you're going to be able to go ahead and have unique control over every single header, mm -hmm. three pin or four pin. A new addition for this generation is that for all the chassis fan headers, we can automatically detect whether they're a DC or PWM based fan. Oh, that's nice. uh, before, uh, you had to manually go in there and select whether it was a PWM or DC fan, but we can now, of course, do all the previous stuff that we were able to use so we can calibrate every single fan, figure out its minimum and its maximum. Also, another very important point that a lot of people forget about is that there's temperature input mapping on all of the boards. Oh, nice. So that means that uh, historically, your CPU fan uh, and any of the fans you have connected only respond to the CPU temperature. Uh, but of course, with our boards, you can have the fans respond to different temperature input sources. So for this generation, we've even phased in the GPU for them. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have, uh, let's say, your front intake fans in a chassis respond to the GPU as opposed to the CPU, you can do that. And that actually makes a lot more sense. A lot of times when you're playing a game, the CPU is very well cooled and mm -hmm. it might be sitting like at 50, 60 degrees, but your GPU could be getting into 75, 80 degrees. So it makes more sense to actually have the ramping uh, or intake airflow respond to the GPU and not to the CPU because in most gaming scenarios, the CPU is actually going to be running cooler than the graphics card. Excellent. So great to have that option. Yeah. And there, there's definitely even a lot more that's uh, packed in in terms of the fan controls. Um, we'll touch a little bit when we kind of talk about the formula and some of the add-on functions. Okay. Um, but definitely uh, for users, they don't want to forget the granularity and control of uh, also being able to assign the output signal hmm. for the fan headers, which is pretty cool. So um, while we're going to talk about maybe number of fan headers, uh, people forget that if I can set any fan header to a PWM output, that means I can buy a cheap just PWM splitter cable mm -hmm. and then power that from the power supply, but have all my fans actually controlled by the motherboard. So that's great like on a chassis where you might have like three front intake fans, mm -hmm. just connect those to one single header because they can be grouped and controlled by one single one. So even though the board might have six, which maybe you're in your chassis or your build, you're gonna use 12, you could actually cover that easily by one single board because we have the ability to do that output control. Nice, save money on fan controllers. Yes. Okay, sure. uh, so shall we start in on the prime board? Sure. All right mm -hmm. guys, so this is the uh, Z270 Wait, dash A. Yep. So part of the Prime series, black and white aesthetic. Uh, of course, like all the boards, KB Lake processors, uh, as well as uh, support for DDR4. Uh, and this board 
has a lot going on. I mean, considering that it is uh, what you would kind of consider your mainstream offering. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, what we consider our entry level, it's our performance entry level, entry level board. So it's usually okay. going to be sitting around that about $150 price point, but you're not really missing anything. You got our full digital power delivery control and design so that, of course, you're going to get a great management experience for being able to, of course, overclock it or tune for efficiency. You've got USB 3.0, you got USB 3.1. Uh, speaking of that, also, of course, we have our new specialized USB 3.1 internal header, oh, yeah. which is great because for the latest generation of chassis that are coming to the market from companies like Inwin, Leanly, uh, there's a header that's going to allow you to go ahead and have flexibility that you can just run that straight into it and be able to maximize the throughput. Um, updates from some of the previous generations are also going to be uh, that we've incorporated the safe slot design there too. So while really most users don't necessarily need to worry about that legitimately in terms of having their PCI slot break or anything, if you do move your system uh, from place to place or you just want to actually have confidence in there, um, it's nice uh, in terms of an addi addition to have on the board. Um, it's also important to note that every board that we're going to talk about fully supports Intel Optane, uh, okay. which is going to be a uh, requirement if you want to run Intel Optane in conjunction with your hard drive. Uh, whether it's a mechanical hard drive or an SSD, it has to be a Z270 chipset. It has to be using a KB Lake series CPU. Okay. So, um, and we are, of course, a validated partner with Intel in that respect. If you're looking for other uh, cutting edge IO tech too, uh, just like in previous generations, all the boards, including this one, they can support Thunderbolt uh, VR, just like Thunderbolt 3 adding card. Okay. Uh, so you don't have to pay the immediate cost of having that built on board. Um, one other nice thing too, also I'll say um, on this board is that it, like all our other boards, is it. We talked about that all these boards have a high number of fan headers, but some unique things that in addition is you got the fan extension card, which is a great little add-on. It's 20 bucks, gives you three more additional headers or mm -hmm. four if you use it like a splitter. Um, so you can even have more connected uh, fans. You've got a dedicated all-in-one water pump header, which is nice, uh, so especially for all these using uh, those type of things. And you've got a high amperage header. Oh, so. Cool. Um, the high bridge header, a lot of people kind of wonder, well, what is that really all about? And it can really be used in a couple scenarios. Of course, you could just use it to power a fan, but it could also be useful in situations where you want to power actually a higher performing uh, water cooling pump. Uh, so oh, okay. you'll usually see those broken down in terms of white here. So you can see that we've got one that says AIO and then the other one says high amp. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, and I then am. in terms of all the standard stuff that you would expect, you know, we of course have, a, you know, an Intel NIC and, uh, you know, both Type A and Type C connectors for USB 3.1 and, you know, great build quality throughout. So Does, everything uh, you really asked for. Got M.2 down here as well? Yeah, so you got dual M.2, so you got one right at the top and then we have another one down here. And like oh, always, yeah, too. we've tried to maximize uh, thermal isolation. So in most mm. situations, I'd say if you're initially going for one, use the bottom, of course, because this is going to generally get the best airflow from the front and you're minimizing uh, hot air from the GPU and from the CPU section. If you're gonna be running two, then of course you've gotta go in that configuration. Not seeing as many U.2 connectors this time around. Is there any, any reason behind that? I think it's just because you're seeing uh, there's not as many drives and the additional mm -hmm. drives that have come out to the market outside of the Intel 750 series, they're focused a little bit more towards the professional ser uh, segmentation of the market. Okay. So it is still awesome though. And it definitely, if you're looking for big capacity drives, keep in mind that you can now get U.2 in over four terabytes. Damn. So pretty awesome. That but is nice. That's why it's a little bit more common on, let's say, like our X99 series. And if you really do need it, you can use the HyperKit to exactly add that on with an M.2 slot. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, moving over to the Tough series, and we'll start off with this one. Uh, this is the Mark II, uh, mm -hmm. Tough Z270. Uh, and this board is a little bit more lightweight, a little bit smaller, the uh, slightly reduced ATX size, so it's not quite as wide. Um, so it should fit in slightly smaller cases, depending on your situation. Um, but what? This is a, a much more affordable uh, yep. Tough Series board than we've seen before. Yeah, well, it, it's pretty similar to the Mark II right now in terms of being a price aggressive board. So it's mm -hmm. very similar to the price band that you're going to see for the Dash A. And really kind of some people, what they wonder what's the big difference between like the Dash A and the Tough Series is really it's in the heart of the software. Mm -hmm. So with Dash A, we give you the full complete uh, auto tuning technology. So for dynamic real time auto overclocking, which is really awesome, right? CPU specific, uh, cooling specific, all that great stuff. Tough Series doesn't have that, but for this generation, we have updated the thermal radar software to include performance tuning. Okay. So it doesn't have the same level of customization for a complete dynamic real-time auto overclocking that the Prime Series does, but you can still get one-click optimization. Uh, really where the differentiation is gonna come in for Tough is gonna be in the validation for specialized um, items. So, so things like I said, like Xeon Phi, 
uh, quadro cards, Tesla cards, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. Also the componentry, all the componentry generally is a very high level in terms of its uh, specification. So we've got like 10K rated capacitors versus like 5K rated caps that you're gonna find on the Prime Series of boards. Uh, the ESD connections, a lot of people forget about this, but the most common point of failure, I'm pretty much on always on motherboards, unless it's like end user induced, is going to be uh, electrostatic discharge. So mm -hmm. it comes from like plugging in flash drives, removal of different devices, or shorting on metal metal contact. And so all the IO uh, throughout the entire board, not only on the back, but also for your front connectors have much, much higher performing what are called uh, contact and air discharge ESD diodes. Okay. Um, so that allows the board to essentially be much more durable in the long term. So if you really, really, really care about having the most durable type of board, it's a great choice. Also for cooling purposes, most of the basic boards like Prime only have a, a few temperature input sources. Mm -hmm. So outside of the CPU, uh, with the Tough Series, you're always going to have a huge amount of thermal input sources, generally a minimum of at least 10. So you can really manage your fans to respond to exactly the different type of temperature points it's that you like want. It's like you've got your top PCIe zone and your lower PCIe zone. And yep. you, there's lots of zones. Uh, I also noticed uh, you still have two M.2 slots on this mm -hmm. board, which is also freaking awesome. Uh, lower profile it seems like in this area over here. Yep. Is there any particular reason for that? Uh, no, it's just it just a, it's just a cost factor in terms okay. of trying to maintain it. But we still do a lot of intelligent design aspects, so these are all still right angle to allow mm. for easy connections, right? And you still have a total of six ports on here, um, so there's nothing really uh, compromised. But really, the only thing that's uh, I'd say a clear drop down would be the audio. It's still a very good quality uh, Realtek, I think 887 audio codec. Uh, still has isolation, operational amplifier, but not as nice as that update that's on the uh, the Primate. Okay, and there are a couple mount points here for the 3D printed stuff that you guys started with the last generation. There are actually a couple of those on the Prime board as well, mm -hmm. um, just on over on this side, and that will allow you to mount 3D printed uh, things that can do things. Yeah, we've got, uh, uh, if you check out the community page that we'll, uh, I'm sure, link in the description, you can get pretty much all types of things like nameplates, fan holders, cable combs, uh, all kinds of different items that we've produced to allow you to go ahead and customize the boards. Awesome. All right, let's move on to the Mark, wait, this is the Mark II. No, no Mark, Mark I. I'm sorry, yeah. I got him backwards. <laughs> I kept doing that before as well. All right, so this is uh, kind of the full fat version of the board. Not only do you have uh, the full thermal armor covering the entire thing, which um, I've always really enjoyed just because it gives a really cool look to the board. And this one in particular, I was uh, mentioning to JJ earlier, just a lot of little design element details kind of scattered through here. Just some texture stuff going on in here. I mean, it's a little bit of like a digi camo look uh, with some sunken different texture. I don't, I don't know. It's it's a weird aesthetic, like attention to detail that you normally wouldn't expect to see on something like a motherboard, but I feel like it works really well. Yeah, it was um, actually inspired um, by uh, modern advanced um, uh, warfare kind of concepts. Okay. So like in uh, the latest uh, generation, you know, like uh, Call of Duty where you had like um, machinery built into the soldier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same type of concept. So that's kind of what our ID team kind of went for. It's just kind of infusing this uh, kind of digital camo, but that has also a little bit of kind of like an armature perspective to it. Awesome. Um, but really the areas that you get the improvement on here is that this one gets the bumped up audio codec compared to the entry board. We've got the far more advanced thermal armor design, which not only looks cool, but has all the channeling technology like previous generations. You, you can it. drop in the assist fan there. Fan there will you've cool got, off the VRMs. Exactly. You've got the flow technology so you can channel the different air. Uh, you've got LED, uh, RGB LED lighting zones on here as well, so you can go ahead and control them. Uh, these can customize the, the colors on there. You've got the okay. RGB syncing mm -hmm. uh, that's been incorporated. You also have the dust defenders like always too so that if you want to kind of go for a more blacked out level of look. Um, there's also a subtle difference in terms of the fan control technology. This mm -hmm. one still uses the more advanced uh, what's called tough ice processor which is an independent processor that does all the load balancing and all the pull monitoring on a low level so the CPU doesn't do it. This allows for a faster response and more accurate uh, monitoring information. So once again if you're really looking for the board that's kind of kind of have this insane level of cooling and monitoring control. Um, this is really going to be a board that you're going to want to take a look at. There are 10 four pin fan headers on this board. There's four here. There's two more. Wait, where'd they go? There's four here. There's two more here. And there's four more along the top. Yeah, and then keep in mind, uh, this one can still use the fan extension you can still, fan extension card. You can still add more. Yeah. Uh, tough fortifier metal uh, back plate as well. Uh, I also really like that, both for building and the look and uh, just keeping things durable. Uh, so yeah, good job on this board. Yeah. That's a cool one. All right. 
Let's move on. Oh, oh wait, uh, oh, wait, we forgot. We oh, forgot. no, no, just uh, one update. Uh, some people also wonder about a uh, recent update that we did on Tough Series is most of them now full focus on having dual NICs. Oh, so okay. previously in previous generations, you didn't have ones that have just, so this one has two uh, gigabit Intel Ethernet ports, if that's something that you can uh, you can leverage. Oh, and I also was going to mention also two M.2 slots, uh, one that's covered up by, uh, here by this little protective piece, as well as a vertical one, because uh, they ran out of space, but vertical still works. Yep. Well, it's also about thermal isolation. We could oh, place it in a different place, but we also want to try to make sure that we're always taking thermals in consideration. There's always at least two reasons for everything. <laughs> uh, all right, we're moving over to the Strix series. We have a single board from that series. This is the Z270E Gaming, and uh, JJ told me that there's actually going to be a pretty wide variety of boards in the Strix series, since that's kind of the main gaming series. So mm -hmm. if this one doesn't line up to your expectations, or if you wanted something that's a little bit less or a little bit more, there are probably other options as well. Yeah, if you generally want more, you're probably going to start stepping into the RG territory. Okay. Um, but definitely if you're looking for a little bit more price aggressive, but you still want a lot of the core Strix features, you could drop down. So this is the Dash E. So if you want to drop down, take for instance, you could go to the Dash F. Mm -hmm. um, but I really love the look of this board. I think that it's got an absolutely really clean monochromatic design. It's got this laser etch PCH etch design, which I think looks really interesting, there's, really distinctive. There's polygons on it. Yeah. It's got a two zone RGB lighting. Of course, you have the Aura Sync connectivity. You've got the Slice Slot updates. You, of course, have the... Um, improved audio design and one really interesting thing too for this generation too is their dual operational amplifiers okay. historically on most boards when you have an operational amplifier it's only designed for the front headphone connection but not for the line level out mm -hmm. so depending on how you had your setup connected right you might not essentially get the benefits of that isolated design in that respect this one has one for each yeah so here you have it for both um, so that's another nice area in terms of the improvement um, and also um, for some people that maybe if they're upgrading from older platforms so like you know z68 p67 z77 x50 any of that era and they were familiar with RG boards RG boards never had the auto tuning technology it wasn't mm -hmm. only until the last generation that they formally incorporated it in so it's really cool that I think that uh, for Strix and for the ROG they all feature that auto tuning technology that fan expert technology so all the great stuff that you might have seen and wanted in the prime series in the past is now available on these boards that's wonderful um, there's also a very big update to the Sonic Studio software. And while we're gonna get into the ROG boards, this kind of does cover something that is consistent on both of them. And so some of the really cool things that we do have is that you can have assignable um, audio assignment per application mm -hmm. and all the customization for audio profiling can be done per application. Oh. So take for instance that if you want to go ahead and uh, assign uh, your game to output through HDMI and then maybe something else to output through the line level output and then something else to output through your headphones you could have each individual application have different audio sources set for that you could then uniquely set in a previous generation we had our advanced profiles that we were developing for music movies and games mm -hmm. but they were blanket audio profiles now we can actually apply the profiles per even each application oh. so if you want to actually purposely have game for let's say you know your game that you're jumping into so you're jumping into grand theft auto or evolve or whatever it might be but then you jump back into chrome and you're you know you're listening to spotify you're watching youtube you can have a different audio preset so the level of granularity and control that i think that we're offering to gamers and enthusiasts for this generation is something that's really awesome and once you kind of really get used to being able to have this subtle level of control mm -hmm. it's going to become addictive you're really going to go i can't go backwards that's going to be i feel like that's going to be really uh beneficial for streamers yeah too, totally that's yeah that's 100 percent where we really got a lot of the inspiration and focus is for heavy multitaskers so what we find is people that are jumping in applications and then for streamers uh that want the ability to kind of customize and this also will work with our perfect voice technology so our perfect voice technology is um it has advanced post-processing mm -hmm. for not only incoming but outgoing audio um, and you can also now set this up specifically to that. So if you want to have just the perfect voice set to be processing, let's say your incoming game audio, but you don't want it active on anything else, then you can do that. So a lot of really cool advanced level control and all the stuff that we'd expect, like we've already talked about, you know, M.2, USB 3.1. Two M.2. Yeah, all that stuff is going to be on <laughs> I, there. I love having two M.2 slots. Uh, also, this one has the RGB headers, both at the top and the bottom. And what else? Oh, and Wi-Fi. Yeah, so that's a, another kind of thing call out is that for the previous generation, the programming where it didn't have Wi-Fi, so mm -hmm. this is a 2x2 two two, 811AC. That's extremely fast. You know, mm -hmm. for people that are wanting for a reference benchmark, on average with a good AC router, you're talking about three to four times the speed of a 10100 Ethernet cable. So very, very good throughput, very good range, and you get Bluetooth on there too. So glorious. The Z270E gaming. 
I think that is a wonderful all-around gaming board from the Strix line. But uh, let's kick it up a notch yeah. with the ROGs. Um, we're gonna start off with this one here, which is the Hero, named after my dog, Hero. Not <laughs> not exactly, but in- Close enough. He's right over there snoring, so um, it, yeah, we'll honor him at least. Um, so this, the Hero, uh, was it, was the hero first started last generation or was that two no, generations? No, it's, it's actually been now multiple generations. Like I think we can go back four. Uh, four? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Time slips by so quickly. Yeah. So the hero was very welcome by a lot of people because ROG yeah. boards were typically a little out of reach, um, but the yep. hero kind of brought it down. It was the first kind down. of entry. Yeah, yeah. brought it down to, to being much more in reach. I know, I think Steve got one of the first hero boards right when it first launched. So uh, we have metal heat sinks, which look really cool. I just want to point that out. And we so that's... Brushed, brushed metal. That's a, actually a good point. Yeah. So that some people might wonder, overclocking capabilities on pretty much all these boards are going to be identical okay. uh, in terms of having a great, reliable, uh, solid OC experience, whether you're talking about 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 plus gigahertz, mm -hmm. it's not gonna be an issue. What you're gonna find a difference is, is that in the VRM components and in the heatsink designs, they're gonna get more advanced on the higher end boards you go with. Really the main benefit there is you're just talking about thermal efficiency and uh, across the entirety of the VRM and how it dissipates temperatures. So generally, if you can keep the VRM even cooler, and you can distribute it more efficiently, you're gonna maybe get a little bit better stability under heavy loads and under aggressive overclocking. So it's not a question that you're necessarily gonna guarantee better overclocking experience, mm -hmm. but you can help to ensure, I think overall better long-term reliability under heavy consistent loads. Okay. So especially if you're a gamer that's going under really demanding workloads or you're simultaneously doing stuff, maybe streaming and gaming, it may be a little bit better option if you know you're consistently gonna be hammering the system. Um, but other areas that of course gonna be different, of course, is the ID design. It's got a far more specialized ID design and the audio is gonna be even further kicked up in comparison to what we had on the Strix. Supreme so FX. You get all the great stuff that we already talked about on the Strix and all the previous generations, so you know, pre input uh, power regulator, we've got the deep hop filter, the audio grade capacitors, the isolation, that S audio codec, right? But this one incorporates the ESS Saber DAC, so we get some serious mm. high quality um, DAC processing that's on here. And you tie that in then with everything that we've done in terms of the Sonic Studio suite that we talked about, mm -hmm. plus some really new cool things that we've done in Sonic Radar. Sonic Radar has got an overhaul that we've been working on for literally the last two years. It's an entirely brand new algorithm. It has a new type of display mapping uh, that works a really, really, really granular in terms of showing you, um, I'd say, uh, the result, but um, with a varying level of brightness on the actual radar feel. Mm -hmm. So before all sounds would essentially be prioritized at the same time. And so that could be difficult in the line of fire, figuring out which one is the one that you want to focus on. But now uh, there's a lot more granular control on how it's displayed. And for users that don't necessarily want to focus on a specific audio type that we haven't processed in, you can now uh, select specific frequencies that you want to dial into. So oh. if you want to have like uh, more, um, so if you really subtly pick up things like bass tones or treble tones in certain types of maps or game engines, you can have it display those. So a lot of really cool customization uh, that you have on there. But one other really cool thing that you're gonna have on the RG series boards is also a commitment to people that wanna have high performance, real water cooling configurations. Oh, yeah. And so <clears throat> what we have down here on the board is going to be um, uh, water temperature sensor connections. So for input and output. So usually depending on how you set up your radiator and everything along those lines, if you really wanna be critical and monitor everything, you can go ahead and connect, make connections uh, for your fittings that have those sensors and you can monitor that information. And if you also want to monitor a flow rate, uh, you can also go ahead and connect that there as well. So Beautiful. when you talk about the level of fan control flexibility, the ability to run and control your PWM and pumps and add to that, I mean, the water cooling level uh, control and connectivity is just absolutely awesome. Wonderful. And I also want to point out dual M.2 once again, uh, this one also has, of course, that USB 3.1 header, debug mm -hmm. LED, and uh, surface mounted. Uh, as nice, nice solid start button there just yeah. to, to kick things off. And on the headers too, some people might uh, always wonder, we're still also actively supporting the OC panel and the ROG front base as oh, accessories. Nice. So for users that want to be able to have that really high quality audio connection all the way from the board, all the way to the front of the chassis, those accessories are fully supported. And this one again has the RGB outs at the top and the bottom for RGB LED strips. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting so long. All right, um, this is the M9F Maximus 9 formula, and it is it's wonderful. I've I did some some uh, footage of it earlier. Hopefully that's playing right now, and it looks it looks wonderful. Um, so you have 
But, so it's not called ROG or the thermal armor when it's on. It's ROG armor. It's ROG when it's armor. It's on here. Yeah. Um, but it's essentially performing the same tasks. Uh, I, it's a, a little it's bit a little different. different. On on it's, the tough series, it's actually uh, functional. I would say okay. because it actually has channeling and venting. Really on the With ROG the board, uh, we it's really first and foremost an aesthetic focus. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because um, you don't have the same type of. Uh, assist fans or, or um, shunting or flow rate that control that you can have on Okay. This. Well, I stand corrected. Uh, this does have, of course, water cooling support in the VRM. So VRM uh, water cooling. Updated uh, for this generation. Updated. New uh, redesign from EK uh, oh. for this. So we actually developed an entirely new thin ch uh, micro channel design. Oh, cool. So we even get better performance than the previous generation. Uh, it's, it's copper. It's absolutely awesome. Of course, it's fully hybrid though. So if you want to run it entirely passive just like this, you're still going to get a great experience. But if you want to drop in water, you're bam, you're good to go. And still do that. They ditched the G1 quarter fittings. Though. No, I'm just kidding. They're still G1 quarter. Uh, but other than that, I mean, like everything I feel like you could want just about. What are you guys going to do with the extreme? I, I don't know. We're just going to have to wait and we'll see. We'll have to wait and see what the extreme does. All right. So uh, SLI support. I mean, a lot of these are pretty much um, everything is all optimized yeah. for two-way because you're not going to do anything more than that uh, on this platform. Uh, but RGB, different RGB zones, I'm guessing. Yeah, uh, for... multi multiple RGB zones. So you got okay. it for the PCIe. You got down here for the PCH. You also have it here. And then even actually for this generation, we've gone back and customized this, ah. which in the past, it's been a little small point, but people are kind of like, I, I, I just want that much more. I, so. that, that's okay. Yeah, that, that was actually one one thing that I pointed out with the last version. So nice to update that as well. The IO back here uh, has a fixed IO shield. Yeah, so this was actually brought over from the absolute highest end board that we've pretty much ever made. It was our Rampage 5 uh, Extreme Anniversary Edition board. So it was this fully integrated IO shield. So for anybody that's ever forgotten to put in an IO shield, they will absolutely love this. Um, so it makes things even easier. And there's actually also additional uh, durability benefits because of the direct proximity that we can make with all the actual uh, contact headers for all the IO ports. Um, it significantly improves uh, the air discharge and direct contact discharge. Nice. So in that same thing that we talked about like on tough boards where we get superior protection, uh, RG boards already get upgraded ESD and surge diodes, but that's also put in place. So this board really is absolutely just packed to the gills. Um, you know, one other little thing that we didn't really touch on because it's hard to see is the software package it's been updated across the board so there's new versions of ram cache and ram disk software cool. um, they've also been updated to fully support nvme based solutions um, so you can get some really nice healthy performance gains uh, from trying that stuff out and that's one of those things that definitely you want to spend a little bit more time to find out about if you are interested in rog don't sell the software short because some of the software that gets included really takes things to that next level, whether we're talking about from a gaming perspective and packet priority software, audio customization, uh, or some of those other pieces in terms of performance-oriented software. Fabulous. And of course, still has uh, the ROG armor, yeah. ROG backplate. Uh, yeah, the ROG backplate on the back that is all metal as well. And it's just heavy. I don't know. No, I, it's, I, it's, I like when a board is heavy. It's a, it's a premium board. This is seriously, if you're looking for a really high-end build where you want to be able to control, I think the aesthetic, um, it looks fantastic. And I think when you incorporate also the customized 3D pieces, if you look to get some of those produced, we have some really, really nice ones. Like we have specialized ROGI cable holders uh, to allow you to kind of right angle out your cables that really complement the looking feel of the board. So some really, really cool stuff that we've got there. And if I didn't mention it, Dual M.2, again. One is uh, protected by the panel back down here, and one is uh, vertical at the bottom. Yep. There's dual M.2 everywhere. It just it makes me so, so happy. Um, but that's all the motherboards that we have to talk about today, guys. I'm kind of sad that we're at the end, but um, it's been wonderful. JJ, thank you so much for coming by today. As always, it's been awesome to be here. And uh, thanks to all you guys for watching. Of course, leave comments in the comment section uh, down below. Let us know what you think. Let us know which of these boards is your favorite, because um, I know I can't decide, but uh, I'm sure I'll think about it a lot more. Maybe I'll come up with something. Uh, leave me a thumbs up if you want to, and subscribe to the channel for more content coming at you very soon. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.